and welcome to the fourth annual Central Students Wildlife Conclave. I'm Steve Stewart, chairman of this year's conclave. The goal of these student conclaves is to bring students together and to give them experience in scientific meetings. We feel we will accomplish this with these meetings. You will notice that there are several color of name tags on the various persons around. The green name tags signify our host students. Feel free to ask any one of us any questions you may have or if you need any assistance. The gold name tags identify our speakers and our faculty. For those of you who have not registered or are still deciding on the special events, uh, there is still room on our field trips, by the way. Registration will continue until 12 noon today. Please buy any tickets that you wish to have by this time because we will close after that. Uh, now to give the welcome from Iowa State, we have a professor in charge of fisheries and wildlife section, Dr. Milton W. Weller. Thanks, Steve. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the university and uh, especially the fisheries and wildlife section, I'd like to welcome you to the student conclave. And uh, for those of you who are visitors here, a welcome, special welcome to Iowa State. Uh, you may have noticed uh, already the uh, Ding Darling cartoons uh, around the, the lobby, and you'll see some more later in the day. And this gives a little bit of an indication of some of our history. Iowa State's program in uh, wildlife, fisheries and wildlife, really got started back in the 1930s when Ding Darling uh, promoted the hiring of a research professor here. Uh, that research professor was Paul Ella Errington. And this program um, developed into the wildlife unit program. Subsequently, graduate courses and undergraduate courses developed, and uh, eventually a fisheries unit was established. At the current time, we have about 300 undergraduate majors in fisheries and wildlife. We have a new curriculum in animal ecology. We have about 45 graduate students, and our staff involves uh, both the fisheries and wildlife federal units as well as the teaching and research staff here. Now, recently we moved into some new quarters in Science Edition 2, which is located over in this direction to the northwest. And uh, for those of you who are interested in our facilities, we would like to make special uh, welcome and arrangements for you to visit these. You'll notice some times listed in your program. So we hope you will take advantage of this, not only to see the facilities, but to visit with professors, grad students, and so forth who will be there. The committee uh, that you see listed on the back of your program has uh, done an outstanding job of bringing together very capable speakers, both off campus and on campus. And uh, I think we should proceed with a program, but uh, we're certainly very pleased that you could come. We hope you have a very profitable educational experience, and we hope you have a lot of fun besides. Thank you. Our next speaker is the brother of Aldo Leopold and a businessman and outstanding conservationist, conservationist in his own right. Frederick Leopold spent two years at the University of Wisconsin just prior to spending two years in service in the First World War. He has spent 52 years in industry as a manufacturer of wood office furniture and 35 years in the study of nesting wood ducks, on which he has published in the Condor and in the 1968 Wood Duck Symposium at Michigan State University. He has been given an award for wildlife service by the Iowa Wildlife Federation in 1969 and in 1971 he was presented with an honorary Ph.D. in science from Iowa Wesleyan College for his work in wildlife and industry. Mr. Frederick Leopold. Thank you, sir. Well, I was really pleased to be invited to take part in your meetings. Dr. Mangle uh, has laid out my task for me. He says I'm to direct my talk to my impressions on the historical development of the land ethic concept and specifically to the evolution of Aldo Leopold's philosophy. Can you hear him back? Not very well. Not very well. I'll get closer. Secondly, to give you my thoughts on how this country has progressed in the establishment of a meaningful land ethic. 
As a starting point, I believe that terms such as environmental problems, ecological relationships, the biotic pyramid, and the land ethic are relatively new in the language, although the problems they deal with are of great antiquity. Gathering such as this one can render a real service to the world through what they can accomplish in clarification and in definition of our problems. Aldo has given us a good springboard from which we can hope to make advances. I'll start my talk by giving you some information regarding Aldo's childhood and early training. The Leopold household was unique, even in the years at the very beginning of the 20th century. We were three brothers and one sister. Aldo was the eldest, and I was nine years his junior. Father was our disciplinarian, but he never punished us so far as I can recall, excepting that on occasion he may have shown his disapproval when we deserved such disapproval. We were all given small chores as our responsibilities, and these we generally discharged quite promptly. An atmosphere of chivalry pervaded our regard for the feminine gender. In fact, we were puritanical as to our ideals of the fairer sex, at least as far as our outward reactions were concerned, with distinct reservations as to our inner conscience. Perhaps the recent ditty which says, them were the days when a lady was a lady, and that gent was a perfect gent, pretty well hits the nail on the head. Our family did not attend church, and we boys had our first church experience in our third year high school when we were sent away to boarding school. The early exception was the Lord's Prayer with which each daily session of our public school life was open. Father was a lover of all aspects of outdoor life, especially hunting and golf. He took us on short trips to the country and introduced us to flowers and birds. He taught us to observe what was going on in the wide, wild word world of things natural. He encouraged us to read good books on these subjects. Ernst Seton Thompson was a favorite author, and we all aspired to learn to read sign, which simply meant to interpret the signs we could find in terms of what had probably been going on among the denizens of the wild. So Aldo was an outdoor lad, and he had rigorous rules of behavior guiding his deportment. In hunting, for instance, Aldo never shot sitting game, excepting with a 22 rifle. His first scatter gun was a single-barreled gun, which was to teach him to aim each shot carefully because he wouldn't have a second chance. Game birds were shot on the wing. In case a downed bird was crippled, every effort was made to find that bird before going on hunting. Legal bag limits were scrupulously observed. Greenhead mallard drakes were selected instead of hens as a target. Two long-range shots were avoided to save crippling. And father had quit shooting migratory waterfowl in the spring years before the law abolished that privilege. Father practiced a custom of serving game of all kinds sparingly, even though game was plentiful. He said one should leave the table when, one, when game was the main course, wishing one had had a bit more, and that this led to proper appreciation of the privilege of eating game. Similar customs prevailed as to fish and fishing. Size limits were observed. Barbs were removed from hooks to avoid damaging fish, which were to be returned to the water when not needed for the table. And light tackle was given preference. Our customs in appreciating flowers, especially wildflowers, were governed by similar appropriate 
guidelines. We pick flowers with our eyes, not with our hands. We were taught to enjoy and, and to identify birds. In fact, our household was the first in our area to feed birds in winter. Father was in the business of selling, building and selling birdhouses, but he took no pro profit from the sales that were made. <coughs> that were made. Pardon me. There was one exception in the fact that we were allowed to shoot house sparrows at all seasons of the year. Grackles and blue jays were also considered undesirable and could be shot. Aldo's happiest hours as a schoolboy were those spent usually alone, sometimes with other members of the family, in the field, hunting, birding, studying flowers, fishing, and whenever possible, camping, always in the wildest areas available to him. At Aldo's age 16, father took him camping in the Wyoming mountains and through Yellowstone Park and elsewhere for a month, and that was the highlight of his teenage years. In summer, we had camping opportunities in northern Michigan, going out from our cottage there into the wild country of lakes and streams. Aldo aspired to canoe to James Bay, but he never consummated that plan. And in camping all his life, he was guided by the principle of traveling light and cutting to a minimum the trappings of civilization since he wanted to get close to nature. But I hasten to add that he fully appreciated the company of the fairer sex, including an outstanding ability in ballroom dancing and how to handle a teacup. In middle life at a faculty party at Madison, he and his wife Estella were selected as the best waltzers on the floor. It's embarrassed him, I'm sure, but he liked it. I'm sure his decision to enter the field of forestry was based on the hope that this would give him the maximum exposure to things natural, and following naturally, he would have the greatest chance to learn about nature, and then later to protect those things which were so important to him. Up to this point, I have tried to describe to you the boy, Aldo Leopold, and I hope I, you have an image of a lad who was highly idealistic, to the point of being a perfectionist with little tolerance for mediocrity. He sincerely endeavored to live up to his ideals, and he had little patience for those who were less strict in their own codes of ethics. Like most of us, however, he had an Achilles heel in that on occasion he could ra rationalize minor deviations from the center line. From here on, I shall try to deal with this young man who was later to write a Sand County Almanac. All of you have read his book and therefore realize the tremendous amount of fact and philosophy that he has brought to us. It is beyond me to competently bring his thoughts to you. His sentences are so concise and thoughtfully written to say exactly what he means. In attempting to bring you parts of his message, I, have, I will often use direct quotes. On graduating from the Yale Forest School in 1909, he was hired as a forester by the recently created Department of Forestry. He was assigned to the Na Apache National Forest in Arizona, where he cruised timber in the White Mountains out of Springerville. This was 40 miles from the nearest railroad and years before the first automobile arrived in that area. Being particularly observing, he discovered that civilization was already showing its impact on that countryside where early explorers had described the mountain valleys as stirrup deep in luscious grasses, overgrazing had already affected the plant succession so that foliage was sparse and erosion was clearly exacting its toll. Cattle and herds of sheep with their guardian herdsmen wandered through the high mountain valleys, leaving less green behind them as they passed. The change was gradual enough that newcomers failed to recognize it, and older residents paid little heed to the cumulative effect on the land. But Aldo noticed the deterioration and started to write and to work 
in the hope of protecting some areas of wilderness. At this period in Aldo's development, I feel he was primarily interested in the preservation of game range and trout fishing rather than in the protection of wild areas as laboratory areas for the better understanding of ecological relationships in general. His advances in the Forest Service led next to his assignment as supervisor of the Carson National Forest at Tres Piedras, New Mexico, where I had the pleasure of spending a summer vacation with him in 1912. Here his duties related to grazing permits and to timber sales, which were very, a very small factor due to the inaccessibility. He also worked on fire protection, of course. In a short time, he was called to Albuquerque as assistant district forester over the southwestern states. So he became familiar with the wild land still existing in these areas. He promoted the establishment of wilderness areas, specifically in the Gila Forest, where the first federal wilderness area was established, bearing Aldo's name. He had foreseen that wilderness was to become important and that once destroyed, it was impracticable to reestablish it. To Aldo, the existence of wilderness was essential. He says, a blank spot on a map intrigues me, and he hoped that there would always be such blank areas. He says further, there are some who can live without wild things and some who cannot. These essays, the Sand County Almanac, are the delights and dilemmas of one who cannot. This was written two decades after Aldo was a forester, but it represented a life philosophy. Aldo's next work assignment was as associate director of the Forest Products Laboratory at Madison, Wisconsin. This offered challenging problems relating largely to the industrial uses of forest products. But this work did not satisfy his desire to work directly with what goes on in nature's wild laboratory. He still wanted direct involvement in things growing wild, especially in wild game. He saw our resources of game dwindling and even disappearing, and he wanted to get at the basic factors involved, and he hoped he could find ways of protecting game from the growing scarcity and to assure a continuing population, population in a wild and natural condition. He realized that game had great reproductive capacity and that this ability, if given a chance to operate, could turn the tide of diminishing population to provide a degree of stabilization and perhaps even of increase. He resigned as associate director of the laboratory and spent several years in study and, his writing, and in writing his book entitled Game Management. This book he dedicated to his father, Carl Leopold, whom he described as a pioneer in sportsmanship. He followed this by his employment with the sporting arms and ammunition manufacturers for whom he made a, germs, a game survey of the north central states and his findings were published as a, in book form under that name. Here still, he showed that his main interest lay in maintaining a shootable surplus of wild game, which of course was also the, um, the objective of the ammunition people. At this time, some of all those many friends and admirers in Madison and elsewhere recognized that he was leading the way toward new fields of knowledge and research, and they convinced the Board of Regents of the university that they should establish a graduate school of game management and should appoint Aldo to be head of this new school. The facilities provided were minimal, but Aldo attracted a group of devoted students who became so interested that through the next decades, he found great satisfaction in the work that his students produced and in the leadership which they exhibited in the field. It is a cardinal principle of game management that game populations are affected by relationships known as limiting factors such as food, cover, predation, and others. 
The path to increased game population lay through an understanding of the relative order of importance of these factors. Progress could be made most rapidly by correctly evaluating this relative importance and then devising means of modifying the most unfavorable factors in the order of their importance. This opened up a glimpse into the field of ecology and its effect on the biota. This is a way of saying that land, in, all its in, in its all-inclusive definition, could only be healthy through recognition of ecological concepts. Therefore, viewing land from an economic viewpoint only would result in demoralization of the natural relationship existing in the wild and the destruction of the ability of the land to function as it should and as it had under wild conditions. The biotic pyramid that developed was bound to be affected to the detriment of all levels in that pyramid. It remains only to recognize that man himself is a part of that structure to conclude that man must learn to respect the bio these biotic relationships. Somewhere in these Madison years, which included his experience at his shack, he proved that land once despoiled could, with help, start to recover and rebuild given opportunity, love, and time. This is where I feel he first recognized that an enlightened public concept of a land ethic would be essential to ensure the safety of man's future on our earth. He attacks the matter, the matter of definition of this philosophy in many sections of his essay on this subject. Starting with his opening paragraph, where he describes the hanging of Odysseus slave girls who were suspected of misbehavior. But since slaves in those days were property, no question of ethics or propriety was involved. Ethical structures of the day covered wives but had not yet been extended to human chattels. During the 3,000 years since that day, ethical criteria have been extended to cover many additional fields with the corresponding shrinkage in those in, judged only by expediency. The first ethics dealt with the relationship between individuals. Later accretions in the field dealt with the relationships between individuals and society. There is as yet no ethic dealing with man's relation to land and to the animals and plants which grow upon it. The land relation is still strictly economic, entailing privileges but not obligations. He speaks of the community concept where the whole is composed of interdependent parts. Here man is prompted to compete for his place in that community. That is, his instincts modify, motivate him to survive on the land, but his ethics prompt him also to cooperate so that there will be a chance to survive through his better understanding with the whole community, including soils, water, plants, animals, or collectively the land. He goes on to say, we sing of our love and obligation to the land of the free and the home of the brave. But just what do we love? Not the soil which we abuse and send helter-skelter down the rivers. Not the water which we assume to be useful largely to turn turbines and float barges and to carry away sewage. Plants, we exterminate them, likewise wild birds and animals. Here, of course, is where we must learn to cultivate the ethical conscience about the land in the broader sense. If we are to keep the land in condition so that it can continue to support our pyramid of which we are a part. I am surprised Aldo does not use more examples in man's own history to note the cycle of disappearing civilizations, some of which have flourished in past centuries and ended decaying sometimes because of climatic changes which may have been either the cause or may have been the effect of advanced wastage. He does say that Abraham knew exactly what the land was for. It was to drip milk and honey into Abraham's mouth. He goes on to say, at the present moment, the assurance with which we regard this assumption 
is inverse to the degree of our education. Perhaps this latter assumption of Aldo's was not altogether right, because there seems to be evidence that some highly educated people still cling to the milk and honey hope. Aldo defines conservation as a state of harmony between man and the land. Despite de decades of propaganda for conservation, progress has been at a snail's pace, consisting largely of letterhead pieties and conven convention oratory, while on the back 40, we slip two steps backward for each one forward. The usual answer to, this, to the solution of this problem is that we need more conservation education. No one will debate this, but it is certain, is it certain, that only the volume of education needs stepping up? Is something lacking in the content as well? Education in land ethics presently defines no right or wrong, assigns no obligations, and calls for no sacrifices, implies no change in the current philosophy of values. In respect to land use, it urges only enlightened self-interest, and just how far will such education take us? Education actually in progress makes no mention of obligations to land over and above those dictated by self-interest, and the net result to date is that we have more education but less soil, fewer healthy woods, and as many floods as in 1937. The farmer recognizes as ethical an obligation to such rural community enterprises as better roads, schools, churches, and basketball teams, but land use ethics are still governed by economic self-interest, just as social ethics were a century ago. The abuse of land does not yet stigmatize the owner's status in the community. Aldo says, it is inconceivable to me that an ethical relation to land can exist without love, respect, and admiration for land, and a higher regard for its value. And by value, he means, of course, something broader than economic value. He means in the philosophical sense. Perhaps the most serious obstacle impeding the evolution toward a land ethic is the fact that our educational and economic system is headed away from rather than toward an intense consciousness of the land. Your true modern is separated from the land by many middlemen and by innumerable physical gadgets. He has no vital relation to it. To him, it is the space between cities where crops grow. There is little hope of real progress in city dwellers as a group, but let us hope that people who live and make their livelihood on the land may be awakened to a realization that they must open their hearts to a broader concept at, of their responsibility to our land, and that is an ethical concept of their responsibility. Aldo describes the present situation in several areas of the world. Western Europe, for example, carries a far different biotic pyramid than Caesar found there. Yet the soil is still there, and with the help of imported nutrients, is still fertile. There is no visible stoppage or derangement of the biotic circuit. Western Europe has a resistant biota. The pyramid so far has retained its habitability for man and for most of its other natives. Japan seems to present another instance of radical conversion without disorganization. Most other civilized regions display various stages of disorganization, varying from initial symptoms to advanced waste stage. In the United States, the degree of disorganization varies locally. It is worst in the Southwest, the Ozarks, and in parts of the South, and least in New England and the Northwest. This display of disorganization in land seems never to culminate in complete disorganization or in death. The land does recover, but at some reduced carrying capacity for people, plants, and animals. Dr. Mengel has asked me to give my thoughts on how this country has progressed in the establishment of a land ethic. As you can infer from my earlier remarks, I am not encouraged. But let me offer a simple suggestion which you people might find interesting as well as practicable in the direction toward which we all seek for the future. 
Granted that agriculture must produce enough saleable product to perpetuate its existence, but, we, but how about devoting a corner of the back 40 of each farm to nature by throwing a pig tight fence around a few remaining rough acres found in most farms today to establish a place where nature can take over. Instead of calling in the bulldozer to smooth off the last contours and to make the farm 100% productive to the exclusion of birds, beasts, fishes, and wildflowers. After all, the farm is a place to live as well as a factory to produce a saleable product. The crop areas are too barren in winter months to provide the minimum cover and food for wildlife. But a small nature area can provide much that is needed if cattle, stock, the plow, and fire are kept out. Natural weed and brush growth will take over to enable wild things to survive, survive winter's hardships and they will provide a breeding stock available in the spring to spread out over crop areas in the next growing season. Giving some natural controls against damaging insect pests. You know, chemical controls are showing that they can fail through the pest developing immunities to treatment. We may be wise to retain some of nature's checks and balances. Other interesting products of such a nature area could be small ponds with potential fishing, waterfowl, and muskrats, etc., where suitable dam sites can be developed. Wildflowers of amazing variety can be blooming through most of the summer months. Mushrooms and wild berries, edible for both man and wildlife, can be introduced or may likely volunteer. There is much evidence that man today takes for granted his ability to devise and create his own set of rules or laws under which he proposes to conquer the world to his own private and exclusive benefit. He fails to recognize that he is a small, albeit an important, link in the biotic pyramid. This short-sighted viewpoint seems to many people to be working pretty well. From the short view, it does seem to be working to the aggrandizement of man and certainly to his multiplication. In fact, man seems to have set aside the law of survival of the fittest because many whom nature would have denied the right of reproduction are succeeding in that effort. How long can this go on before the pyramid, an inverted pyramid, loses its balance and collapses? Are the techniques introduced in recent years increasing agricultural production real advances, or are they, as auto questions, just improvements in the pump rather than permanent improvements in the well from which we draw? Again, quoting the case for a land ethic would appear hopeless, but a minority which is in obvious revolt against these modern trends. The key log which must be removed to release the evolutionary prospect process for an ethic is simply this. Quit thinking about decent land use as solely an economic problem. Examine each question in terms of what is ethically and aesthetically right as well as what is economically expedient. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. The motivation to produce our desired ethic is social approbation for right actions and social disapproval for wrong actions. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Leopold. The chairperson for our morning session is Galen Bass. Thank you, Steve. I think we'll get started this morning with our land use symposium. Resolved by the Committee on Flood Control, House of Representatives, that the Board of Engineers for Rivers and Harbors is hereby requested to review the report on the Skunk River, Iowa, with a view to determining the advisability of undertaking improvements for flood control in the Skunk River Basin at this time. Adopted December 18, 1945. This House resolution and a similar one passed by the Senate in 1948 were the first authorities given to the Corps of Engineers to initiate flood control studies at of the Skunk River, Iowa. The report from these studies, dated 1951, recommended two reservoirs, one of these being on the Skunk River northeast of Ames. The Board of Engineers reviewed the report and sent it back for further study, but further in investigation remained in a state of inactivity until 1963. In 1963, the Iowa Natural Resources Council indicated that the U.S. Interstate 35 project conflicted with the proposed reservoir site. Afraid that they might lose a good reservoir site in Iowa, the Chief of Engineers in 1964 directed that a report be made and be completed by the end of that year. The finished report recommended that a dam and res reservoir site be constructed on the Skunk River upstream from Ames and the purposes being flood control, water quality control, water supply, fish and wildlife benefits, and recreation. Lack of funds, however, kept the project from going any further. The Environmental Policy Act of 1969 and growing public, public opposition to the project created more studies to be performed. In 1972, the Corps contracted the Iowa, Wa Iowa Water Resources Research Institute to do an in-depth study of the area. The institute headquartered at Iowa State University used their resources here and also resources for the University of Iowa. Now in 1974, it looks as if the reservoir is stopped. This morning, we would like to describe some of the important aspects of this study. First of all, we'd like to give you an introduction of the area, and then we'll go into some details on the res reservoir project itself. After that, we'll give you a description of the institute study, and then the description of one of the alternatives to the dam. And to get things off and kind of give you a feeling for the area, Paul Anderson, a graduate student in landca landscape architecture here at Iowa State, will give you a talk on the visual aspects of the Ames Reservoir site. Paul? First of, <clears throat> excuse me, first of all, before I start, I, I should give special mention to my uh, alleged cohort this morning, Mr. Uh, J. Craig Taggart. He decided rather than disappoint all of you who came here specifically to see him this morning, that he would put some of his college experience to work, and he agreed to run the slide projectors this morning. <laughs> Ever since Frederick Law Olmsted, designed Central Park in New York in the middle 1800s, and then later in the century, century, he planned Yosemite as a state park. Landscape architects have been known both as designers and as planners. And the Ames Reservoir Project gave us a perfect chance to put both of those capabilities to work. Both a visualization of the reservoir site and a quantification of the resources that exist on that site. The presentation this morning will be divided into four rather uh, indistinct parts. Uh, first, a regional perspective and some idea of the surrounding land, uh, land use changes in the area. Second of all, a visualization through slides of the existing site. Uh, an idea of the potential visual changes that could occur on the site with uh, the proposed reservoir and several alternatives. And then fourthly, a quantification of the resources that exist and a quantification of some of the changes, potential changes. Craig, do your thing. <laughs> Thank you. 
side of the photograph, north is up. Um, the story city is right here. The Muskoka River between Ames and Story City. The South Slope River is below Ames. We can see several things on, on this photograph, I think. First of all, we can see the broad floodplain here in the south of Ames. Skunk has a broad floodplain of uh, one or two miles in this area, with uh, some timber on the slopes. We can see the valley north of Ames, the Skunk River Valley, is being run and narrow. And the timber filling all of the, slope, the slopes as well as the narrow valley. We can see some of the tributaries in the area. We can see the agricultural farmland in between. We need about three more hands. Let's move next to a skylab photograph. This was taken last summer. Again, we can see the South Stone River below Ames. Here's Ames. North Stone River, Story City. Here's a landmark that uh, you can use to orient yourself in all these photographs. Interstate 35 below Ames. Here's the swing in 35 around the Stone River and then north past Story City. Let's uh, fly a little closer to the Skunk River area. This is an infrared photograph, all colored in red, taken in late spring or early summer. We can see the dark fields as being plowed, probably planted, but yet the crops aren't enough to give us the red tinge here that we associate with uh, vigorous vegetation. And then getting a little closer, we can see our Landmark here to swing around the valley. Another fall coloring for red shop. A little later in the season, you can see a crazy quilt pattern of a uh, farm field. We can see the valley with the timber showing up a very dark red. We can see uh, the water areas being kind of dark here for orange also. We can also see some dark depressions filled with water. This photograph I'm going to be taken after a rain. And then if you look closely in uh, this area, we see the Doolittle Pablo Prairie, which some of you will be visiting later on today or tomorrow. Let's take a little closer look at that area. Let's take a look at some of the physical <coughs> changes, the land use changes in that area over a period of 40 years or so. This photograph was taken in the spring of 1939, the USDA photograph. Um, ASCS will take these photographs about every seven years now, use them for crop inventory, nature distance, but they're also used for quite a few other things. Uh, a couple things to look for. Over here on the left, stringer along this drainage ditch. That will be changing over the years. Another thing, right in the center of that northeast, northwest border, there's a small tree. Of course, that will grow larger over the 40 years. The cropping pattern in this northeast or northwest border section will be changing. And again, grows the pot of the curve. This slide taken in uh, for the photograph was taken in uh, 1953. Notice a, a little change in the cropping pattern. The tree has gotten larger, the fields have gotten larger. Slight decrease in the cover over here by this farmer's tent. And then in 1972, <coughs> notice the absence of cover and springer along the street. This quarter section is now one field. Tree in the middle really stands up, and uh, the potholes have some on the southern area have been uh, drained and now cultivated. Another change, natural changes that dog owners can't stop. You know, some people with their uh, dredges would like to stop. I'm sure uh, this channel is straightened 
in the early part of the century. Uh, it's begun to be ended now in 1939. 1965, it's beginning to be quite a bit more. Notice some of the cover areas over here have decreased, and we notice a big change in this photograph, especially in this view, and an increase in the end. Natural changes occurring in the end. Also, we use our resources in, a, in another way, extractive resources. This limestone quarry north of Ames had its beginnings in that small area. 
much at all, so I didn't have to drive my freedom more than that way. <laughs> Other years of Let's jump over to the other side of the river, the east side of the river, and start rolling and follow the very creek down to Silver's Mill on the right. <coughs> here, if you can't see Bear Creek, it's the one here in the middle of the long way. Okay? This has nothing to do with Bear Creek, except that it does add a little bit. Been in this 
area. Then I'll, uh, I'm sure they'll say that Bear Creek is one of the nicest areas to walk through, as you can see by some of these slides. It does offer quite a diversity in the, in the spaces, the vegetative cover, by diversity in the stream itself. Well, by the way, this is not uh, a boreal relic. I believe a, a landscape architect or a botanist, someone did live in this area and do a little planting himself. Again, our visualization from the changes that occurred at the top is the preceding sketch of the preceding slide. The middle is the arch conception of the conservation pool, the bottom of the flood pool. This is a uh, southern pond, which was uh, dropped from interior considerations by the Corps early in our study, but that was after we had paid some attention to the air. Then going over the interstate. Right by the scenic overlook. And Bear Creek here in the foreground, flowing in the Skunk River here in the background. And Silver's Middle Area just from the left. Silver's Middle Area was a state fishing access. In fact, it was south of the ridge. Often the heaviest use is north of the bridge. And I think uh, John Gordon and Mark Atkinson will be addressing themselves to some of these problems in the future. Here again, the arts conception. The historic Gold Spring Bridge in the area. This area is, happens to be north of the bridge. You can see why a lot of people like to go along the trails in this area. Not only walk, but I guess ride. The river widens, the valley widens, and we get toward the dam site. This happens to be Peterson Quarry on the west side of the river, down by the dam site. Of course, not only do you have vegetative and wildlife resources to think about in uh, building a reservoir and in the nation, but you have extractive resources like gravel and limestone. South of the dam site, we're looking back towards Skunk River here, going in a new shape. Another quarry which is out of the uh, influence of the reservoir site, Howell's Pit. And then Skunk River in the foreground, looking southwest for the This is 
again, um, slide of the, a link slide of the reservoir site, the interstate curve here, Stoke River, North City at the top of the reservoir, or the dam site, the proposed dam site, just off the slide on the left. Harvest conception of the previous slide. With conservation pool overlay. The uh, stipple area here between Tangley and Stoke River is a very flat area of the flow. I suppose beauty is the eye of the beholder. Uh, some people look at these slides and they say, um, you know, that's a tremendous view of uh, what could be a, a tremendous lake. And there are other people who say, uh, you know, where did all the uh, timber go? Where did the cover go? So I guess uh, we have to look at these through our own eyes and make our own judgment. Again, we have our choice. Another of our jobs was quantification of the resources. We did this in a 34 square mile study area. Scope River flowing up to the center. Here's Story City. Each square mile was gridded off into about two and a half acres of rectangular cells. Each cell has an address, a unique address. Here at the top, it's got a column number. Here down the side, it has a row number. The resources can be inventory, the soil type, vegetation type, um, present directions of the archaeological site can be stored on a magnetic computer tape using the unique address for each two and a half acres of land in the study area. There's about 8,000 cells. Here's an example of soil type. One cell containing several soil types, but we also not only recorded the primary soil type, the one that occupies most of the cell, but also the secondary and tertiary. And we can recall that information. This happens to be restricted soil types. Here, the lightest cells, uh, primarily occupying the flows, are uh, soils having erosion restrictions. And the cells mainly grouped in this area have wetness restrictions. We can overlay the reservoir on this, find out the loss. 